webinar on Dynamics GP 2015 new features. Uh, my name is Dave Feenstra. I'm a senior technical consultant here for uh, Maynard Kasterison. We are uh, we are excited with the re new release of 2015. There are some uh, some very interesting new features that they've uh, that they've released, and so we're going to walk through the ones that probably are most pertinent uh, to our end users. There are some behind the scenes changes that we will talk about. But again, there's nothing uh, real pretty to show on those. So the, the new intro screen to GP automatically sets everybody's user ID to I love GP. And uh, I guess you can change that if you uh, don't really want that. But uh, anyway, so we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So the first thing I wanted to look at was just kind of a roadmap of where GP has come and where it's going. And as you can see, uh, with GP 2013, they really started to move up their release cycle. And so now instead of uh, service packs lasting over a period of time, they've started to do major functionality releases every six months. And we saw that with GP 2013. They had uh, 2013 service pack one and service pack two. But then in the first half of 2014, uh, they released 2013 R2, which had some significant updates to it. And then in December of last year, Microsoft released GP 2015. And again, they, they keep building on a theme. So as we go through the slides, I'm going to be referencing a few things from GP 2013, because I'm not sure how many of you might have already updated to that. And there are some significant updates uh, in 2013 R2 as well that GP 2015 builds on. Let's go ahead and start with some of the system-wide changes that uh, Microsoft has made and also some of the additions that they've made to the business intelligence capabilities within GP. So the first thing that they did, just kind of as a system-wide, is to assist in the setup of new users. Uh, oftentimes we have users that uh, they want to be set up, but they want to clone somebody else's home page. So they have now added that functionality uh, to the core GP settings. Uh, there's also better integration with Management Reporter in uh, 2015. Prior to this, Management Reporter operated completely outside of Dynamics GP, and uh, you had to launch a separate application to get to your reports. They have now added some navigation lists uh, that will list all your Management Reporter reports right in the GP interface. Uh, much the same way that they do with the Excel reports and with the SQL reporting services reports. Uh, they've also made some additional additions to the Smart List Designer. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what Smart List Designer is, it was uh, introduced in GP 2013 Service Pack 2. So they've made a few additions to it uh, since then. But what Smart List Designer does is it's a, uh, a simpler way of having the end user or allowing the end user to uh, build some custom smart lists. Uh, some of you might compare that to Smart List Builder. Uh, I like to refer to it as a Smart List Builder very light. So it has some of the capabilities, but not all of the capabilities that Smart List Builder has. Uh, another big thing that was introduced with GP 2015 was the service-based architecture. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, they've also the service-based architecture leads to the next one, which is the new version of Business Analyzer, uh, which is really geared towards running on tablets and smartphones and allowing users to access their data from GP anywhere at any time. Uh, we'll have a we'll take a quick snapshot look at that, and then also with GP 2013, Microsoft really put an emphasis on the web client. Uh, and they have continued to improve on the web client. And with 2015, they've added a couple of additional modules uh, to the web client, but largely the changes for the web client are in ease of administration and installation. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So with that, uh, I think what I want to do is look at each one of the features, and then we'll pop over to GP and just take a quick look at that feature. So the first one that, uh, that I want to look at is the copying home page settings. Uh, now, I'm going to pull GP 2015 over here. You can see 
Everybody's home page can be completely tailored to the way they want it. You can add your own custom quick links. Uh, you can have reports in your My Reports area. You can have your page situated in a certain way. Uh, oftentimes, new users will come in, and the system administrator will want to make their home page clone an existing user. Previously, you would have you could set up the structure of it. You could give a, a default role, but now you can actually say that during the setup of a new user. Um, they can go ahead and copy somebody's entire home page. And we're going to look at that in the user setup. And I have a, a new user in here called conveniently new user. And if I wanted new user to have the exact same home page as another user, I now have a copy settings uh, function that says, all right, I want to copy everything from the SA, and I want to include the roles that he has. I want to include everything that's on their home page as well as their individual area pages, the way they have everything set up in each one of the individual modules. Uh, so I can turn these on, and I, if I wanted to, I could actually copy that from a different user. Maybe I wanted to copy those pieces from DynSA. So either way, it allows me the flexibility of setting up a new user and just speeds up that entire process. All right, so after the uh, copy home page, uh, we have the navigation to management reporter. Now, in the past, everybody who has management reporter, which hopefully everybody has by now, if you have FRX, give us a call. We need to get you off of FRX. Um, FRX has actually been discontinued for some time by Microsoft now. So uh, if you're not converted to management reporter, we should get you there. But anyway, previous uh, to GP 2015, we had all of our default reports, and we could come into uh, Management Reporter, and we could run them, and they would deploy either to the uh, a web browser or to the reports library. But you always had to launch an outside application in order to run those reports. What they have done now is added a navigation list in GP that ties to Management Reporter and then lists the individual reports that are out there and gives you more control over Management Reporter directly from the GP interface. And what that looks like is you'll see on all these tabs we have the various area pages up here. Uh, and now they've added a new one called Management Reporter Reports. Now when I click on that, I'm going to get a navigation list. However, you're going to notice that my navigation list is empty. Uh, management reporter really needs to run on a, in a server environment in order for it to read those reports. I am on a workstation, and therefore it is not reading my reports. But you can see what it's allowing us to do. Uh, any report that I have access to in management reporter would appear here. I also have the ability of coming up here and giving it a new management reporter report. And when I click on that, it actually launches the management reporter uh, designer. So it is still a separate program. It is just more tightly integrated with uh, GP2015. Right. Next item that I want to look at uh, is the management reporter integration options. Uh, for those of you who are using analytical accounting, you know that management reporter uh, had used with the with the classic connector, it had two different connectors, one for uh, just GP, standard GP data, and one that included the analytical accounting data. There was also a Data Mart option, which synced all of your GP data over to a data warehouse, and then all of your reporting was done from that data warehouse. Uh, the new options in GP will help speed up some of the report processing by allowing you to select what data you want to expose to Management Reporter. Do you want just the general ledger data, or do you want analytical accounting data as well? And that is going to be in GP. And so when we, uh, see if we can uh, get back to it here. There it is. Uh, so we'll find that in our 
administration tab, and in the company setup. Up here, if I go to company, and then go to my options tab, you'll see down here I have the ability of enabling general ledger reporting or analytical accounting. For this particular company, I do not have analytical accounting activated, so therefore that option is grayed out. The whole point there is that it's going to uh, reduce some of the time that it takes your GP data to sync to its internal data warehouse. Okay, and then we have the refreshable Excel reports. Uh, this is in addition to the SmartList designer that we have out there. And what they have done now is enabled the end user to use custom SQL views. Then those would be queries that are over on your server, but it allows the end user to use those queries to then build their own custom smart lists. And where we can see that is if we go to administration, uh, previously uh, in GP, to get to the smart list designer, we would go to smart list, and then we would have to go up to the new uh, option. Microsoft has added a new tab or a new menu option to go directly to the Smart List Designer, and that's located under the Administration tab and under Reports. So if I go into the Smart List Designer, you can see I can now come down to Views. And I can look at views that are either system-wide or that are specific to my company. And what this is doing is it goes out to your database and looks at any custom views that might have been created out there. Uh, if you do not have access to the SQL Server, generally your uh, database administrator or system administrator would go out and create those views and expose them for the end user. So the way that would work is I can look at some, any of these views. Now most of these views that I have out here are out of the box Dynamics GP views that they provide for you uh, for doing different queries. So I can go to the Account Transactions view and I can just turn things on like journal entries, series, transaction date, uh, debit, and credit. And then I can see what kind of query it's building down here. Uh, or I can actually see what data is being returned. And then I can hit, uh, I, I can give that a list. And I'm going to say um, lunch and learn uh, GL transactions. And then I can, uh, I can hit OK on that, and then I can actually use this uh, for then building an Excel report off of it. If I come down here, you'll see I get my Publish uh, button that lights up. And at this point, I can then publish an Excel report. So that Excel report is now out there for anybody who has access to it to view. It just adds one more level of flexibility uh, to the Smart List Designer product. Uh, next thing I wanted to look at was actually what this service-based architecture was all about. And, you know, unfortunately, service-based architecture does not have a, uh, a nice pretty screen for me to show. But what it does do is it, it's a building block that Microsoft has put in in order to allow uh, end users, uh, developers, most likely developers, uh, to build various applications against GP that would then expose various parts of GP to outside processes. Uh, a very simple example to understand this would be the posting routines in GP. Currently, the only way to post a batch is by going into GP, selecting the batch, and, and posting it. What Microsoft has done with the service-based architecture is they've wrapped all of those processes into various services that can be called by outside routines. Um, so uh, one of the examples that I've heard from Microsoft is that now from outside processes, independent software vendors or ISDs or developers can now call the posting routine that's in GP without actually having to be in GP because that posting routine is wrapped up as a service. Um, and again, the main purpose that Microsoft is adding that feature for is to make your data available anywhere at any time. And we'll see that in the next, in the next thing we're going to look at here. 
because the, the first app that Microsoft has released that's using the service-based architecture is the new version of Business Analyzer. Now, Business Analyzer has been around uh, for a few years. The out-of-the-box Business Analyzer that Microsoft has that is available to be deployed to any desktop in your organization, doesn't have to have GP installed, uh, is a simple viewer tool that allows users to look at reports that are deployed in SQL reporting services and then control how they want to see them. I can go through any one of these reports. I can have various users that will uh, that they can pick certain reports that they would want to see. I can control how I want to look at it. Um, maybe I want to go into dashboard mode, in which I'll see all of my reports um, kind of stacked together, however I want the window to lay out. Um, another thing that, that it automatically does is it's set to resize everything based on how I move the window around. Uh, other applications, it tends to be when you resize the window, you either hide data or you don't see everything. Uh, that's not the case with Business Analyzer. I can set any number of reports on here and I can go through them. And this is really good, but what if I want to view this same data from outside of my organization? And that's where the service-based architecture is going to come into play because there is a, a uh, version of the Business Analyzer that if anybody is running uh, Windows 8, or 8.1 and is running on a tablet or anything, they, they do have a version of the Business Analyzer that's out there as an app. You can go to the Microsoft Store and get it. And I'm going to pull it over here onto the screen. If I can grab a hold of it. There it is. Okay. So here is the Business Analyzer that you would normally get on uh, the Windows Store. Now I'm running Windows 8.1 and so I can pull this up. Uh, but you see that the Business Analyzer just gives a very clean view of my data. Now, right now I'm running this in sample mode. Uh, and so it's, it's just using some sample data because I don't have all of the services installed. But it really gives flexibility for seeing uh, the various roles. Maybe I want to look at the accounting manager role. And here I'm looking at more uh, budgets, gross profits. Uh, if I want to look at the CFO, I'm seeing more along the net income uh, side of things. I can look at my various companies. In this case, I have three companies uh, that are set up. And if, I, if I'm looking at consult, Contoso Consulting USA, you see everything's in U.S. dollars. If I look at it here, everything's going to be in pounds, so uh, in, the, in the British side. So it just really gives some flexibility for installing this app and viewing your data. Now anybody who's currently running um, Windows 8 on a tablet, uh, I don't believe it's uh, available for the iPhone just yet. Uh, I'm, I'm probably wrong on that because uh, I know that that was coming. Uh, but you can go out to the Windows Store right now and download that. And you'll see if I, uh, if I jump out to the Windows Store, If I come out here and just search for the store and look at Business Analyzer, there's Microsoft Dynamics Business Analyzer. You can go out, download this, and run it in sample mode just to see what it's all about. I think the, the appearance is very smooth, it's very clean, and uh, very informative. And again, all of the charts on here can be custom tailored uh, to what your company wants to see. So, Okay, so now, uh, you know, that all looks really cool, but now we're going to move into like the boredom of uh, financials. You know, we're going from nice, clean reports down to just, you know, what did they do to some of the uh, uh, standard modules. Uh, so what I wanted to do here was just kind of compare uh, what they did in 2013 R2 and some of the features that were there and how they're building on that with GP 2015. Uh, for those of you who have not upgraded to GP 2013 R2 uh, yet, the, the one feature that's at the top of the list on the R2 side, the copy and 
the misspelled paste to GL um, is probably the single most feature that would make upgrading worthwhile. Uh, it's very, uh, very clean. It, it uh, is easy to grab the journal entry in GP and paste it right into the general ledger transaction entry screen. Um, and so you can see some of the, the basic uh, features that they've added with R2. And then in also in R2, they introduced the whole concept of the workflow that's all built right into GP. And with R2, they, they um, created a couple of basic workflows for requisitions and things like that. Uh, but in 2015, they really built out on that. Uh, they've added workflows for just general ledger batch approvals. Uh, payables batch approvals, vendor approvals, uh, you can see the list there. Uh, and what that allows you to do is to create a batch and prior to it being posted, you can run it through a workflow approval process. Maybe I need to route it to my manager who needs to route it up to her manager in order to get it approved before it's actually posted. Uh, GP now has that workflow engine uh, built right into its system. And we'll look at that here more in, in just a minute. First thing I want to look at with financials was is uh, enhancements that they made around the intercompany. Uh, pre previously, when you looked at a journal entry, in uh, if you had an intercompany journal entry that spanned across a couple of companies, uh, it wasn't easy to see where it went, and if you needed to correct it, you actually had to correct it on both ends. Uh, and now with 2015, they've made it so that when you look at when you're looking at the journal entry inquiry window. Uh, more complete transaction information is displayed, uh, including the destination company and the offset accounts uh, that were used. Uh, the intercompany transaction processing has also been updated so that if a change is made to a uh, transaction for the originating company, the change automatically flows through to all the destination companies. So if you void an intercompany sale in the originating company, the sale is then voided in the destination company at the same time. There's not a whole lot to look at right now because uh, all I would pull up is the journal entry inquiry screen, uh, and you can see that on your screen. So uh, it just makes the intercompany uh, functionality out of the box a little bit smoother than it has been in the past. Another thing that was added uh, in the financials, and this could be you know kind of borderline financials or uh, the distribution side, was a warning message. Uh, that they have now added so that if you start to enter a payables transaction for a vendor that has an open receipt, a purchase order and a receipt, then it will warn you uh, because we've seen it many times where an invoice will come in and the person processing the accounts payable doesn't realize that that invoice might actually be attached to a purchase order or to a purchase receipt. And then what happens is they enter the payable, they cut the check, the vendor is happy, your books are right, but now you're left with an outstanding receipt out there that has never been invoiced. And that can tend to cause some balancing problems. And so what this is meant to do is to warn you uh, in case uh, that situation exists. And to look at that, let's jump over to GP. And if we go to uh, purchasing, you'll see uh, I have uh, previously processed a receipt for one of the vendors. And so that receipt is out there just in a receive status. It has not been invoiced yet. So if I go in and just start entering an accounts payable transaction uh, for Ace Travel, and I start entering my invoice and I'm going to put this in a batch and as soon as I save that it's going to tell me this vendor has an existing purchase order and it's going to give me the options to automatically go there and take care of it in the proper screen. If I truly don't care that he has an open receipt and I want to continue with my payable uh, entry then I can go ahead and continue to do that. But if I hit the go to it's going to bring me into my purchasing navigation list uh, for the vendor that I was on. And we'll give this a uh, second here to refresh. And it's going to show me everything that's out there for this particular vendor. 
and we can see right now that I've got a shipment out here uh, that has not been invoiced yet and so I can come in here select that and then I want to go ahead and do an invoice I want to invoice this receipt and so it gives me a quick way uh, right through my payables transaction entry of getting to the proper area in GP where I need to be to truly process that invoice okay the next uh, item that they've uh, that they changed is uh, around the payment terms uh, those of you who have um, done payables through uh, GP for some time know that the payment terms that are in GP are pretty standard. They have the net 30, there's discount terms if it's paid within a certain number of days, but we're seeing more and more invoices where the payment terms are due by the 10th of next month or due uh, you know, two months from now plus 10 days, something like that. Uh, GP has now made it uh, more, a little more flexible on how the payment terms are set up. Um, and we can get to that through administration and company setup and we'll go to payment terms. And so you can see I still have the ability of just doing my standard net 30s where I can say you know net 30 days from the transaction date but maybe I wanted to uh, do calculate the due date off of the discount date. Maybe I have a you no, know, I want to calculate 30 days from my discount date, which is five days. Or maybe I want to add a certain number of days to it. And I also have the option of uh, doing the discount. Uh, before it was just a discount with the number of days. Now I can say a uh, certain part of next month, or maybe you know I'm going to give you a discount if you pay it within a few months. Um, I just have a lot more flexibility on the payment terms uh, that, I'm, that I'm setting up. Okay, the next thing in the financials is a year-end close report uh, for fixed assets. And this has been something that clients have asked for over the years because uh, fixed assets in the past, when you close your year, it's just kind of this enigma that's out there. You push the button and it does something and you hope it did it right. Uh, but now they've actually added a closing report that will come out much the same way that a financial year-end close happens. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show that to you because I don't really want to close a, a fixed asset year in my system right now. But there's a picture of it on the screen there, and when you process your fiscal or your uh, fixed assets, your end close, uh, that's what you're going to get. Okay, then, and that's about all for the financial module. Then for uh, on the distribution side of things, which is uh, sales order, purchase order, whatever, um, there has been the ability since GP 2010 to email. Um, customer statements, uh, EFT remittances for, uh, for payables, and sales invoices. Uh, the issue has always been that if you wanted to, let's say you sent that out and it was to the wrong email address, it was not easy to change the email address that was being stored on that item in order to resend it or to send it to somebody completely different as a copy. Uh, GP has now opened that up. Uh, so that you can go in and edit the email that's on a, uh, a historical document. Um, I would uh, I would show that, except I am not hooked up to our email system at the moment. Uh, but what it allows you to do is I can just show you a screen when we go into like sales transactions, and I look at sales order transactions. And we'll let that come up. Uh, what that will allow me to do is I can see that these were sent in an email at one point, but I can now come in and I would have the ability here to edit the email uh, that these are being sent to if, if I were hooked up. So, but that would uh, that that allows me to I can do one, I can do a whole pile of them. Maybe somebody's saying, "Hey, I want all of my invoices from last year." That's fine. I'll highlight them all and resend them all. So. 
And then finally, like we talked about earlier, uh, Microsoft has done a lot of work around the workflow engine that uh, that is embedded completely into GP. And you see in 2013 R2, they had some of the basic ones out here. They had a purchase order approval. There's a, there was a new requisition process uh, that they have put a workflow around. Um, they have, uh, those of you who are familiar with 2013 R2 know that they went to a, uh, very much of a self-service suite for payroll. And so there was a, a workflow around time cards and time sheets. And in 2015, they just built on that process. And like we mentioned earlier, there's now general ledger batch approvals, uh, receivables and payables batch approvals, uh, approvals for, for adding and modifying vendors. Um, and also through all of the different areas of payroll and also in project accounting, any project expense reports uh, that need to be deployed, they have um, added workflows around that as well. So uh, with that, I wanted to quick show a, uh, what the workflow setup screen uh, looked like. And you see, I can go into workflow maintenance, and they have, for all the different modules, they have multiple workflows that can be set up. And I just created a simple one that, you know, when I uh, create an AP batch, I want to notify a manager. Again, I can have my tasks be set to email. Um, I can just have them be notifications within GP. But I can build as complex a, a workflow routing as, as I need to in here. And Largely what this is getting around in this workflow engine is that Microsoft has very much moved towards an employee self-service, uh, what they call the self-service suite. In um, 2013 R2, they released the initial version of the purchase requisition. They also did a few other things that employees can get in and do themselves. And in 2015, they have just added onto that employee self-service. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with how these work, uh, the employee self-service areas around requisition and the payroll stuff is all replacements for the business portal uh, components that GP had previously used. Uh, I believe the business portal was still around for 2013, uh, but for 2015, they are uh, no longer supporting uh, the business portal integration and instead are replacing it with uh, actual self-service screens within the GP system. Now, people have asked, does that mean that I need to have GP installed on everybody's workstation in, in my organization that I need to be able to give access to payroll or to any kind of requisition? And the answer is no, because uh, that is really where the power of the web client uh, comes into play. Uh, Microsoft has also introduced the concept of a light user. And so now what people would need to do is you would just need to have a light user license for everybody in, in the organization, which is at a greatly discounted price. Obviously, it's not the same price as, the, uh, as a full user in GP. But then those employees would then access the GP web client and handle requisitions and payroll transactions and everything. Uh, from that GP window through the web client. I do not have the web client configured uh, right now to show that to you, but the components that have been installed that would support that, uh, we saw those on the home page. And you see, around that employee self-service, they've added two new uh, components that can be added to the home page. One around the procurement, which is the requisition management, and one around time management, which is all the payroll stuff. And so if you're a light user, you log into the web client, you would have access to one or both of these, depending on what you've uh, had permissions to, and then you can do what you need to do in here. And you see they give you the punch list of what you need to, uh, where you need to go. So what do I need to do? Do I need to enter a purchase requisition, in which case I would come in here, and I can add a requisition, much like I would a purchase order, and then when I'm done, I can then submit that through a workflow. And so if I wanted to view all the purchase requisitions, I've, uh, I've got a few in here. 
Here's a couple of workflows that or a couple of requisitions that I've added. You see I have those there, but then I also have a visual indicator in a queue that tells me what status some of my requisitions are in. I have two that have already gone through the approval process and are ready to transfer to a purchase order. Uh, same thing around time management. Uh, users would be able to come in here and they can enter their own time. And I'm looking at all my time cards here and right now I don't have that activated for my user because I'm considered a salary user so you don't need to enter a time card. Um, but I can also come through, view my pay stubs, so I can go through and look at any of the stubs uh, that I've uh, generated over, that I've had over time. I can just shoot that up to the screen or to a printer. You can see my name is Pilar Ackerman. Uh, so I can do any of those things uh, through here. And that's what, what the rest of my slides we're going to look at is what exactly is all in the self-service. And you see I've got the, the home page. That's what we looked at. I've got the new home page parts that allow me shortcuts to where I need to be. Uh, I have a much simpler navigation. Uh, and I can preview data before I actually submit it. Same thing with the requisitions. The entry is very similar to the way the PO entry worked. I can submit it to a workflow and I can, actually, I, I can do requisitions for inventory or non-inventory items. Uh, around the employee self-service, I have all of these areas that I can uh, modify now on my own uh, without having to you know, call the HR department or submit some paperwork. I can take care of these myself. And then they are all routed through a workflow for approval before they become permanent in the system. And the same thing around the project time and expense. Uh, there's, uh, there's additional uh, home page modules around that. So the rest of these, uh, I just wanted to kind of look at what some of the uh, appearance was of some of these. You, you notice that the screenshots that I have on my slides are actually from the web client. So this is actually what the, uh, what the end user would see. Uh, again, this replaces the existing requisition management module that is currently only available on uh, the SharePoint side and on the business portal. And this replaces that entirely. And so I have full control over all of my requisitions just by being a light user and accessing GP through the web client. Same thing with the time management. Uh, it allows me to now put in my time and I'm putting it directly into GP. Again, if I'm not a normal GP user, this is the only access that I would have because uh, I've had some uh, questions about, well, if we open it up to everybody, would they be able to get to uh, financial accounting data? And the answer is no, because uh, all they would have would be access to time entry. And again, that also goes through a workflow. Uh, I can update my employee information. Um, you know, any you know, name, address, uh, you know, marital status, whatever, I can, uh, I can adjust that myself. And again, it all goes through a workflow. I can update my benefits, uh, my benefit selections. A lot of times this will uh, be used during open enrollment uh, for people to select what they want for the upcoming year. Pay stubs, we saw that really quick where I can reprint my pay stubs without, uh, without having to bother anybody else about it. And I've got my W-4 information, and again, that all is routed through a workflow uh, before it is actually uh, committed in the system. And one of the ones that is probably the most useful is uh, adjusting my direct deposits and what accounts and the amounts that I want to uh, send the data to. So the whole idea is for uh, GP, Microsoft is making GP to be more readily accessible to the end users, to make it easier to use, and using the service-based architecture to be able to allow you access to your data anywhere and anytime. That's all I have. Uh, again, my contact information is on the screen. Any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. And so with that, thank you very much for attending. And uh, I hope you found it uh, informative.